All right, welcome to the show. I'm so excited today because we get to hang out with one of my favorite people, Marilyn Zecker. She's my mentor, taught me everything I needed to know about multisensory math. And I wanted her to come on and talk about it because she is the source. She is the place I went to to learn how what we do at Made for Math. And she is amazing. Marilyn, but I want to give you an opportunity to tell people a little bit about you and your background. Well, uh, I started out as a music teacher and people are always saying in my approach, they really want all the rhythms and chants. So I did start as a music teacher. And then when they started firing music teachers at the elementary level, <clears throat> I became uh, recertified in English language arts, but I was really fortunate because I was in a program that was designed on the Orton Gillingham techniques for teaching reading. And this is way back in the dark ages before the dinosaurs, when we really <laughs> didn't have those in public schools. Yeah. And <clears throat> so I taught in a classroom for a number of years. And when I left the classroom to travel with my husband, when he retired, I decided, okay, when I came back, I'll just start doing academic support. And I noticed that my Algebras, my high school and middle school algebra teachers, then it was mostly high school, were not doing well in algebra, though I knew they were very bright. And I started pursuing this math piece. And I was so lucky because it was in the 1990s, just when all the neuroscience was coming out. Yes. They had the fMRI studies and some of the major researchers were starting. And the more I did a deep dive into why my students might not be doing well in math, it started me on this very long journey to look at learning differences and how they impact mathematics. Yes, so I did I certify, it. I'm a language therapist, a certified academic language therapist. And I have now after 25 years become a specialist in applying these kinds of strategies to helping students with all kinds of learning challenges succeed in math. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> I think one thing I love about your method is you yourself have dyslexia and I think you can see that in the method, but you have a different brain wiring. So you've created a method that definitely speaks to those kinds of kids. I, I um, often in my class, Adrian, I'll say to people, okay, how many people in the room missed recess for six weeks because they couldn't do the mad minute and multiplication. And then I raised my hand and, you know, it was, it was one of those things that caused trauma for me. And you'll hear Joe Bowler talk about that today about you know, many are, of our methods for teaching fluency are punitive, and they really make people not want to like math and, and not do well in it. Yes. And that's just such a fallacy, because it's like reading, we know 95% of children who are struggling with reading can be taught to read. Yes. And yes. I truly believe that most of our students can get a very good working fluency with their math facts. But we just can't give up. Yep, I totally agree. I totally agree. So let's tell, let's share every, with everyone, you generated a multi-sensory math approach mm -hmm. based on the research that started coming out in the 90s and has continued to keep coming out. You're always updating your work. Will you share with everyone what is multi-sensory math? It's a new concept for a lot of people. Well, I, I have to preface this also by saying I'm not the first one to talk about this. We had people going back into the 1970s who were people in the field of Orton-Gillingham reading instruction who thought we can apply some of this to math. They didn't really take it as far as I have. Uh, and so I, I, I did a course with Dr. Joyce Steves who was one of the first International Dyslexia Association people. So I don't want everybody to think I'm just sure. you know the, the first person. And going back into the 1940s and 50s, um, Anna Gillingham taught everything she taught to dyslexic students in a multi-sensory manner. But I think one of the things I have done that, you know, changes it is that I started looking at it from algebra down rather than where does math difficulty begin from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk now about what multi-sensory math is, it's not simply using manipulatives to teach math. Right. Too often we see teachers who put things in children's hands and say, now here, get an answer. And it's not, a, it's not an inefficient calculator. <laughs> and so we have to be careful of that, that we are teaching mathematics in a way that uses all sensory areas as much as we can simultaneously. That's part of the key. Now, I haven't figured out how to teach math with smell, but I'm working on it. <laughs> but, <clears throat> you know, we, we know that 
information goes into the brain through what we call a multimodal process. We see things, we hear things, uh, we touch things, we measure things against our own body size. Magnitude is one of the things I'm really railing about now. We can talk about that in a minute. Hold that sure. thought. Yes. But uh, when we talk about taking in information, we know that it converges in the brain and it creates memories in different source spots in the brain. So in her book, um, Brain-Based Strategies for the Inclusive Classroom, uh, Judy Willis talks about the fact that we create memories that are kinesthetic, that are, you know, think of getting up in the middle of the night and it's pitch dark in your room. You know where everything is because it's spatial. It's a body awareness. Right. So that memory is stored in a different place than the place that visualizes and recognizes faces. So we are creating memories in different parts of the brain <clears throat> that support retrieval and comprehension and visualization. And so we're looking at the neuroscience and we're looking at how does a specific student interact with their environment and especially in learning. And we try to see if there are problems, how we can deal with that with other sensory areas to support them. But the key is that even in a diagnostic prescriptive approach, which is what general multisensory education is, the key is that if we do this for all students, we're helping the most students yeah. because we're not targeting it at a specific deficit, but deficits in general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With that, the instructor should be aware of how learning differences impact mathematics. And we look at the learning challenges of things like attention deficit or of processing speed, the oral language. You know, when you think of a student at the middle school level going through a sequential complex math problem, they're talking to themselves internally. Yes. And that's that internal monologue is built on oral language. So the student who has trouble with word finding, with uh, oral language and describing things, who hems and haws a lot and says, you know, that thing, that thing we dry your hair with, yeah. that's <laughs> the student who's going to have some trouble with that sequential <laughs> operations <laughs> and retrieving, for instance, multiplication facts. I think right. one of the most profound things that has come out from the neuroscience, and this is uh, Sally Shaywitz talks about this in her book, Overcoming Dyslexia, and other neuroscientists have talked about the fact that unlike basic addition and subtraction, multiplication is language dependent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If I challenged everyone in the audience right now to name the 13 original colonies, yeah. you would start to visualize the map. You, know? you would. I did. <laughs> and, and that's just word retrieval. Mm -hmm. So multisensory math, in essence, is using what we know about the way the brain learns and remembers and then gives us back and we're using a very precise instructional language because the What Works Clearinghouse says in some of their practice guides, and for you parents out there, the What Works Clearinghouse practice guides has a synopsis of the best research in teaching, yeah. what, works. what works. And so at the front of each practice guide, it'll say, this has strong evidence to support it. This has moderate evidence or weak evidence. And then they have suggestions. And in one of the most recent practice guides, they actually talk about precise instructional language. Now, that's not the child discovering something in an interactive lesson and problem solving to figure something out. It's direct instruction with precise instructional language, which is concept based. It is retrievable, repeatable, and mathematically accurate. So yeah. we're not borrowing and carrying anymore because honey, we ain't giving nothing back. <laughs> so those yeah. of us who learned math in the days of borrow mm -hmm. and carry need to get with the program. We have to use language that supports mathematics instruction and is retained by the student and used and lived with by the student. Yeah. So when I put it all together, what is multi-sensory math? It is using manipulatives to illustrate a concept not to get calculations and answers, though it can be used for that. It is exploring side by side all sensory areas. So if you're using manip manipulatives, 
and you use that, uh, we call it an evidence-based instructional sequence called concrete, pictorial, or representational to abstract, that sequence helps our students move from objects to numbers on a page. Yes. And it's a bridge. It can go either way. So we start with that, put it in their hands, describe it, name it, and then move it to a picture and then move it to, that's portable memory, then move it to just the numbers and the algorithm on the page. Then when you follow up, you can do, oh, would you do this problem with numbers and let's prove it with the manipulatives yep. or with a drawing, or let's draw this three digit number in a base 10 block representation. Now imagine what it would be to double it. Imagine what it would be to add 10 to it. Uh, so it's using all sensory areas, an instructional sequence, which facilitates learning and memory by using all sensory areas with manipulative objects and a diagnostic prescriptive approach that looks at the myriad learning challenges that can impact students and tries to figure a way around them to teach the math. Yes. It's very that. wordy, I'm sorry, but. It's wordy, but it's, <laughs> it's really what's going on. It's, it's a complex process. So it's yes. manipulatives, precise instructional language, concept-based, concrete representational abstract sequence, and helping our students to visualize the math and then be able to reason mathematically as they go through math. Yes, it's excellent. It's one of the best, I think, flows, approaches, formats I've ever seen. Because it wasn't the manipulatives were new to me when I found you, but it was in the way in which they're put together and using Joyce Steve's flow and lesson plan game changer. It changed the outcomes for students drastically. And so that's why I was so excited to go all in and really, you know, study side by side with you. And you, you uh, talked about the fact that I keep updating things. I've just been working on a modification of the Steve's lesson plan for classroom teachers in public schools, where we, where we can look at that lesson and say, this is the component of the lesson where we can add our skills building and intervention components and still keep working on grade level concepts. Yes, yes, it's awesome. Um, you have, you've talked about like the superpowers in math and I would love for you to talk a little bit about these must have skills that students have to have. Um, would you care to elaborate on some of those superpowers? That's just, you know, when I talk to teachers about how we talk about teaching math, I was trying to think of a way to make it amusing and memorable, especially for elementary teachers who are sometimes the giants upon whose shoulders we stand. Yes. Our elementary educators are teaching those foundation skills that are so important for building higher math. And they think, oh, well, I'm just teaching a child to count to 120. No, you're teaching the child how we organize things, mm -hmm. uh, how we organize quantities to build the place value system and imagine both very big and very small numbers. So those, those beginning skills that occur in like grades K through five <clears throat> begins with numeracy, which there's a word everybody should get to know, and it's called subitizing. Yes. Some people say subitizing. I say subitizing. I say subitizing. But yeah. <laughs> the subitizing is automatic recognition of quantity and or quantity patterns. And we know from the research that the human brain can recognize up to four items without counting. That's the kid in the high chair who doesn't know a number or a word yet can recognize four without counting. Beyond that, it should be in some sort of a pattern. Now, there's a lot of different discussions about the types of patterns we can use. I tend to like dice patterns, but there are people who use other patterns and that's perfectly acceptable. But we do have patterns and children learn that numbers up to like seven or eight or nine can be composed and decomposed different ways. So just using a single representation doesn't help them to add and subtract across a 10. Right. They need to know all the different ways to build nine, that it's five plus four and it's six plus three and it's seven plus two and eight plus one. They need to learn those patterns. And too often, teachers get bogged down in those first numbers one through six and then say, oh, just count on to add and count back to subtract 
that student gets to fifth grade and they can't subtract yes. because they're subtracting 27 yes. or they're subtracting 39. <clears throat> so numeracy and subitizing are our first superpower. Now think, our second superpower, if I know that three plus four equals seven, can I use that to understand that 30 plus 40 equals 70? Mm -hmm. Can I use that to understand that 300 plus 400 is 700? So a lot of our understanding at the place value addition and subtraction level is built on and dependent on that first numeracy and subitizing skill. So when parents are playing dice games with their children, playing games that use dice, especially dice where they have to add two dice up, that's a fabulous way to build that early skill. So our first superpower is numeracy. Our second superpower is place value. And I usually define that, you know, as uh, understanding what numbers are made of and what their name is. So I talk about expanded and standard form. So expanded form tells me what a number is made of. It's made of 110, four ones, and I visualize that, I build it, then I identify that visual and tactile component with its name, 14. And it's built on numeracy. Now I can use place value, my superpower, yeah. and now I can visualize larger numbers. Our third superpower involves the operations of multiplication and division and that I can act on those larger numbers. So if I visualize what it's made of, it's made of 100, two tens, three ones. And I visualize that by saying it, 100, two tens, three ones. Can I imagine what two of that quantity would be? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I often say to teachers, it's the distributive property, but it's really dealing with multiplication and division. Yeah. So that our students can do multi-digit multiplication, multi-digit division. And so our second superpower is that next level. The final superpower that goes through grades four and into grade five is understanding the magic one. What is it to be one? Well, mm -hmm. one is like the the old spy in the mad magazine uh, comic book. So he opens his coat and he's got five different names. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one can be one. It can be two halves. It can be five fifths. And so understanding what your one is and how that magic one can impact all of our fraction operations is very telling up through square root two over square root two yeah. is one. And so understanding that move from whole numbers to fractions is that second great superpower. And for you parents out there, you need to know that we look at testing and we can see where students start to fall out of the woodwork. So we have lots of our students with learning challenges who do well up through second, third grade. And then suddenly they hit multiplication facts and they tank. And that's because it's language dependent. A next big hurdle that I see in my summer programs, my intervention programs, is students who cannot subtract using six, seven, eight, nine, or they get to fifth or sixth grade and they are totally lost with fractions. That's the mystery of the universe. And in fact, in state test scores, we find that all students have scores that go down once fractions and decimals are introduced. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, you know, those first four superpowers, those different levels up through grades four and five are really key to successful math in middle school and high school. Absolutely. I'm really excited because um, on the show, I'm going to have David Geary, who's a researcher, and he's dedicated his career to studying math learning disabilities. And they just wrapped up a study where they're looking at those precursor skills that mm -hmm. have to be in place before you move into algebraic thinking in, in the upper grades. And I have a feeling we're going to see a pattern of exactly what you just talked about. <laughs> I'm so excited to talk to him about that. Um, so all of you watching, like, be sure to come back and listen to David. It, it will be research heavy, but I promise it's going to be worth your time. It's going to be yeah, so and, good. And for parents, that's really telling because, you know, so many parents think everything's okay. The teacher says my, my child is doing fine until they hit multiplication facts. And then, oh, just give them a calculator so they can keep up with their friends. I'd like to throw out a little bit of a new thing I've 
way I'm trying to articulate things for parents. And that's in the terms of accommodations. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about accommodations, we know they're necessary and they're, I mean, I love calculators. Nobody does triple digit division without a calculator anymore. That's true. You know, let's, let's, and we all count on our fingers. Let's, let's, you know, let's just put that out there. But <clears throat> when we talk about accommodations, we have to think of the classification of the accommodation. Is it an output accommodation so the teacher can see what the student has learned from their excellent instruction? <laughs> Is it extra time on a test? Yeah. Is it use of a calculator to get an answer? Is it preferential seating? Is it a quiet place to take a test? But we don't always talk about input accommodations that help the math and the instruction get into the child. These are things that actually can be put in an IEP. Yes. So things like teacher notes, that's a favorite one for social studies and science. It can also be for math. We talk about word banks. Well, in geometry, that's going to be really important for solving proofs. They need to know the definition, but the retrieval of those words might be difficult. Yes. But the input accommodations are everything we do in multisensory math. It's hands-on instruction, explicit direct instruction that is concept-based. We're not giving them mad minutes to drill fluency. Yep. We're actually helping them understand the meaning behind the math. And so it's things like precise mathematical language. It is pausing between units of meaning. Mm -hmm. It's like saying, come in, sit down, get your books. And now let's look at page 342 and I'm pointing to it on the board. Yeah. So that students get time to process what you're saying. Yes. And in math, that can be really critical to understanding. Absolutely. Other things are things like starting with the concept before you get into the nitty gritty. So my algebra students begin the slope intercept form algebra, which is our word problems. We begin with a word problem with simple numbers and we build a physical model of a, of a, uh, a linear function. So we'll talk about a constant rate of change in a starting value in a real life model. You know, I found $10 on the parking lot. I added $3 each week from my allowance. How long will it take me to buy that $420 video game? Yes. <laughs> and they start to learn why algebra is important. Yes. It's problem solving math. Yes. So sometimes that inverted instructional sequence, sometimes it's near point references on the desk where the student who's challenged with math facts can create something they can use throughout the lesson but now I'm going to give you the most, my opinion, the most important accommodation we give. And that is restricted number facts. My favorite. We control yeah. the number facts in the whole class inclusion class instruction, which doesn't hurt any child. Mm -hmm. But it gives the child with disabilities access to the curriculum in a way that if they have to retrieve the math facts on demand, they don't have access because they're expending too much working memory trying to pull out that math fact. Yes. So I don't give a complete times table chart ever because of figure ground difficulties. And you, they spend so much time navigating that sea of numbers that they lose what they're doing. Yes. But having restricted number facts in the classroom is one of our greatest input accommodations. I totally agree. <clears throat> I love that you made that delineation. Um, we find the same thing when we're recommending accommodations that are input based, always. And I think we need to start using that word more. I think so. And too. Not just blanket accommodations. Yes. So yeah. larger font, ample white space and workspace, a piece of paper for drawing, a near point reference on the desk. Mm -hmm. They maybe have their own binder that they do visual dictionaries in that they can refer to. Yes. But those kinds of input accommodations and quick references at, at number line on the desk, not on the wall in the front of the room, but where they can touch it because that tactile experience is part of the counting. Yes. Yes. The input absolutely. accommodations are critical. They totally are. Yes. Marilyn, you have a lot of really fun games that I think parents could definitely start playing with their kids. Um, like make a 10 comes to mind. What, what kinds of games could students or can parents and students play together? 
the, anything that involves dice and dominoes is first for those young children. <clears throat> I have a game called Make a 10, where the parent has a bowl or a plat paper picnic bowl, and you roll five dice in it. And you're trying to see two dice that make five. And you get a point for the one die that says five, but you get five points marked in on the scorecard and a tally mark for two dice that make five. You can play the same game with six. And then we go to make a 10 where we're making 10 across three dice. You have two that make a larger add-in like six, seven, or eight, and then whatever else more gets to 10. So that game uh, is very easy to play and you can play it waiting for an airplane. You can play it on a train. You can play it while the airplane's flying in the air because all you need is a bowl and five dice. Yeah. Another one I like is called chips. And that's one that I, I play with. I get shut the box games. My kids love flipping those wooden tiles. Yes, and I get do. two of them to 12 <laughs> and they can roll the dice and keep playing as long as they can figure out an equation that'll work with the dice they rolled. So think of two and three. I roll two dice. I get a two. I get a three. I can play five with addition. I can play one by subtracting. I can play six by multiplying, but I can also play two to the third power, which is eight, or three mm. to the second power, which is nine. Yeah. So any way I can make an equation using those dice, as long as I can make an equation, I'm in the game. Yep. And when they cannot make an equation and turn a die over, I mean, a, a, a chip over, and it can be played with cards or post-it notes or poker, die, poker chips or anything. Uh, when you finish, the number you got turned down is your score. And then it goes to your opponent who gets to play as long as they can do it. Another one I love, and parents can find this, is look for Michael Minus's website, Loves Math. He does a lot of games with all different ages of students, but particularly young children. Mm -hmm. It can be played with a deck of cards, a piece of paper, some dice. They're very low cost and easy. And then my final game I'm, I'm piloting now in my summer program is from Joyful Mathematics called Multi. Yeah. And it is a cross between tic-tac-toe and chess but it, does, it practices the multiplication tables. And a student doesn't have to be proficient in multiplication to play it, but it uses words like factor and multiple. It shows visuals of arrays. And I remember last sum, summer, the, the lowest functioning student in my fifth grade intervention class beat me. And he walked around, you know, like he was showing his muscles. He was so, <laughs> so impressed with himself. And he was, he did a great job. Mm -hmm. So an adult can play with a child and have a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. And games are such a great way to lower that anxiety and mm -hmm. get the practice in that they need in an environment that's just low pressure. It's such a the, great the idea. The What Works Clearinghouse says that students who are struggling with math need about 10 minutes a day of fact practice. But when you look at the literature, you'll find people like Joe Bowler, you know, out at Stanford are saying, well, they learn better in games than they do in drills. Mm -hmm. So you can play a game with your child for 10 or 15 minutes. And that's like practicing math facts. Yes, it is. It's a fantastic way to do it. Now, I'm sure we've piqued the interest of everyone here. There is a way everyone can learn from you, Marilyn. Will you tell everyone where they can connect with you online if they want to learn more? Well, I'm on Facebook with Marilyn's Multisensory Math, and I have people who contact me through the messaging app there. Uh, and I often will put articles about dyslexia and reading and about mathematics. And I have a thing I call do the math and there'll be, you know, something on math in real life. That's one way. Another way is through my website, uh, which is multisensorymath.online. And I actually have a free video up there for parents. It's called Supporting Broad Math Concepts at Home. And it's one small webinar that gives you a taste of this methodology. Then I have some others and some training vehicles, some of which are more expensive, but still less than taking the classes. But uh, I constantly consider putting things up on that website. Definitely. Always look at your local International Dyslexia Association branch to see if they're having a conference because those are frequently the lowest cost vehicles 
in which I do training for parents and teachers and tutors. So you might get six hours of training for very little money. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a very good source. So far this year, I've done workshops for um, Northern California IDA, Northern Ohio IDA. I just did one for um, the Tennessee and the Kentucky branches of IDA. I frequently present for New Jersey. Uh, so, you know, different branches will offer me in their conferences. And then you get the live presentation as well as a month to view the video. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good way to see my work. I have a multisensorymath.com website, but the email is not connected to that. So that's where you can go for information. And I, I have to admit, I'm so busy. I'm not updating it as quickly, as frequently as I should, yeah. but it's there. Yeah. It's there. And then my, my email is multisensorymath at gmail.com. But right. I'm going to tell you one thing. Parents contact me all the time and say, do you have a tutor in Tobunk, Iowa, <laughs> who is trained in your methodology? And I have to say, I train anywhere from three to 450 teachers a year, but most of them are full-time teachers. So I don't have a tutor bank. I say there's this great organization called Made for Math. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and they work with my methodology. Uh, so, you know, I do summer intervention programs for students, both small groups online and in person, but uh, through the Facebook page is a good way to see it through the multisensory math dot online. And then, you know, in, in something, maybe you're looking for training, you can contact me at multisensorymath at gmail.com. Wonderful. We'll make sure to link up to all of this in the notes so that we make it easy for people to access. But Marilyn, thank you for being here. I could just nerd out with you about math all day long. This was can the, I can I say the thing. last little thing here? Parents, sure. Do things with your kids. Bake things. Use measuring cups. Measure things. Uh, play games. Use math. Take them to the grocery store. Teach them to read a map as you're driving to go see grandma and add up the miles and estimate time do things that involve math and real life experiences. Yeah. That's so important. If you're a plumber or if you're an electrician, talk to your kids about algebra because you're using slope intercept form. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> yes. It's Thank been a you. pleasure. It's been so fun. Thank you, Marilyn. Okay.